The Ten Lectures by Patrick Duffy These ten lectures were produced after a satanic kerfuffle appeared in my father's social media newsfeed. It was engendered by a desire to tear down a wonder beast depiction of Satan. Many of the comments were made by individuals unknowingly progressing the work of the devil's ambassador. So, my father deemed an explanation of how followers of Jesus should understand Satan to be appropriate. L. Duffy, 2022. When looking at John's work, one should bear in mind that his nature was changed when he received the morning star, what some of you call cloven tongues of fire. So he is no ordinary scholar. He was one of the first sons of the light, one of the first sons of God. God is light. John writes as a man who was given divine nature, and it is that gift which transformed John into a child of God. P. Duffy, 2020. 1. A Satanic Kerfuffle The Christian devil is a work of fiction. It has seven heads, ten horns and seven crowns. These characteristics are shared with the first beast encountered in Revelation, but that beast has ten crowns, one on each of its horns, so dragon and beast are similar in appearance. The seven heads on the dragon and the seven heads on the beast indicate seven kings. One of the kings had been and gone. One existed when John was writing, and one was to come. King Eight would be the beast that had been, was not, but would be again. Israel is the first head on the dragon and beast. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome follow. After these come the image of the beast with the head wound and Israel again. Should you want to identify the beast with the head wound, you can do so through Amos chapter 9. It is Israel. So Israel is the beast and it is empowered by the dragon. The dragon was the first enemy of Jesus. The Jewish elite operating out of the temple. The people who had Jesus crucified. John uses the term beast to identify Israel and he uses the term dragon to identify the Jewish elite of Judah. Another clue to the identity of the beast is given in the ten crowns. These ten crowns represent ten kings. Each king represents a tribe of Israel which did not produce a king over a united kingdom of Judah and Israel. Only two tribes produced a king over a united kingdom of Judah and Israel, Benjamin and Judah. The beast is Israel. It is empowered by the dragon. John uses a seven-headed dragon as his old serpent called the devil and Satan. For Isaiah, the serpent is Leviathan, the dragon in the sea. It is the last of God's enemies to be dispatched. Leviathan, the piercing serpent, is derived from Yam, a tyrannical tribute-demanding seven-headed sea power. It is not the serpent from the Adam and Eve story, and it is not a supernatural being. The dragon is the power behind the beast, Israel. John's dragon represents the Jewish elite operating out of the temple. Its time in the pit began with the destruction of the temple and it returned from the pit as Israel came back into being. John uses the term Satan to indicate that his enemy that has spoken against the followers of Jesus at first, would speak against them again. 
John is talking about the Jewish elite. He is not talking about a supernatural being. The dragon is the power, money, and influence of the Jewish elite. Israel is the first beast encountered in Revelation. John's message is veiled by bizarre imagery. The dragon is the first danger faced by Jesus and his followers. And John says the dragon cast a third of heaven's stars to the earth. John is not talking about stars in the sky. He is talking about the decimation of the original Christian community by the Jewish state and the loss of about a third of the people who had received the morning star. Paul had been tasked with destroying the original followers of Jesus and according to his own account, he undertook his commission with enthusiasm. What plans the dragon had for dealing with the followers of Jesus were disrupted by the destruction of the temple. John cast the Jewish elite operating out of the temple as the Christian devil, and he cast Israel as the beast. He is saying that the world will be deceived by a Jewish elite and Israel. The third member of this unholy alliance is the false prophet, an agent of the dragon who wants to make an image to the beast with the head wound, Israel. The false prophet or second beast of revelation is a Jesus imitating agent of the dragon. He can be identified by the tricks he employs and by his desire to build an image to the beast, an image to the beast would be an image to Israel. The false prophet's greatest trick is to make fire, light, from heaven visible to men. These clues identified Paul. He talks of an Israel of God, which is the image to the beast, and he claims light from heaven shone on people with him. Nowhere in Paul's writing or the writing of his friend Luke is the morning star mentioned. They had no knowledge or experience of it. That is why the morning star is called cloven tongues of fire in Luke's work. Paul is responsible for the morning star being associated with a supernatural being masquerading as an angel of light, but no such being exists. The Christian devil is Jewish power and influence. John prophesied that the image of the beast, that is an imitation Israel, would grow into a world power, the last world power to rule before the return of Israel. Paul's false religion did become a world power. It still exerts influence on the world stage. These three entities deceive the world, so anyone who promotes or supports the Jewish elite, Israel or Paul, is doing the devil's work. The harlot is associated with the beast and dragon. She sits upon the beast, and the beast is identified through Amos as Israel. Jerusalem is the harlot. Her merchants are the great men of the earth, and it is by her sorceries that the nations were deceived. The seven mountains upon which she sits are as follows. Mount Garad, Mount Goa, Mount Acre, Mount Bezetha, Mount Moria, Mount Ophel, and Mount Zion. So you see, the harlot is Jerusalem, the beast is Israel, and the devil, Satan, is nothing more than a word puzzle. Now, I am sure many Christians will not want to accept that the devil is a word puzzle, but that is because they have been deceived. John gives clues to the identity of the beast and false prophet. Two obvious clues are the head wound, a reference to chapter 9 of the book of Amos and the number 666, which, if you know how to count it, will give you the Greek letter I. The letter stands for Israel, a political beast in Daniel's sense. 
and the name of a man. And, of course, Israel is another name for Jacob. Clues to the identity of the false prophet are his desire to make an image to the beast and his false miracle, that is, trick of making fire, light from heaven, visible to men. Paul encouraged his followers to see themselves as the Israel of God, and that is how the image of the beast came into being. All Christians should know that the light from heaven shines in the forehead and it cannot shine on people. No one who follows Paul has encountered the light from heaven, so they deceive themselves when they claim to be in the light. There is no light in the churches of Paul. They do not understand this, and that is because they have been, and are still being, deceived. They inhabit darkness. To believe in a flesh and blood dragon with seven heads, ten horns and supernatural powers is an error. It should be obvious that such an entity is a creature of imagination, a literary device. The real dragon is a conundrum and the solution is Israel, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, image of the beast and Israel again. Choosing fantasy over reality indicates psychosis, does it not? John uses riddles to convey his message. One riddle involves locusts, like horses ready for battle, with the power of scorpions. They have tails with stings similar to scorpions. This prophecy of locusts emerging from great smoke to stick poison into people is more impressive than prophecy about the return and reunification of Judah and Israel, or prophecy about the rise of the pseudo-Christian religion founded by Paul, as it contains information reminiscent of the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of the practice of vaccination. A clue to the identity of the locusts is given in chapter 9 of Revelation, and the clue is the locusts have faces of men and hair like women. Faces like men means beards, and hair like women means long hair. The clue is an allusion to Leviticus chapter 19 verse 27, which says, Jewish men must not round the corners of their beards, or heads, leading to the curls or ringlets, payot, worn by some Jewish men. For John, Israel and its merchants are the greatest threat to humanity. Israel is the beast of Christian prophecy, and its Jewish elite is the dragon and Satan of Christian prophecy. 2. Three Trees, Part 1 Three trees are mentioned in religion. Two of them appear in the Adam and Eve story, tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. The third tree, the world tree, is the most important tree mentioned in religion. Fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is central to the garden in Eden's story. It bestows wisdom upon the user. The fruit from the tree is opium, and the meaning of good is good health, and the meaning of evil is bad health. Opium was grown, used, and traded in Mesopotamia, Assyria, Egypt, Greece, and the Mediterranean area. In 1903, Sir Arthur Evans found a Minoan snake goddess. On her headdress, she wears an opium apple that contains scratch marks associated with harvesting the drug. Sir Arthur believed his snake goddess was connected to Wajit, an Egyptian snake goddess. Her cult center was in Bhutto, Tel al Farah Inn, in the northwestern delta. Wajit was one of the most powerful goddesses in ancient Egypt. Her propensity to spit fire 
plus the wings she acquired from Nekfit, allow Wadjit to be thought of as the proto-dragon. Her cult was established in Lower Egypt before unification. It was strong enough to negotiate with the followers of Horus, and after unification, Wadjit was awarded the role of protecting goddess of Lower Egypt. The snake goddess found by Sir Arthur Evans demonstrates a connection between woman, serpent, and opium. Stories that record this association are found in Egyptian and Greek myth. An Egyptian story, recognized as involving opium, says Isis, the goddess, made an invisible serpent to attack the sun god Ra. After she obtained what she wanted, Isis cured the sun god. This story seems to be about addiction so it is not a surprise to discover symptoms reported by the sun god match withdrawal symptoms linked to opium use. Greek myth has it that Guy, the first matriarch, gave golden apples to Hera, the third matriarch, when she married Zeus. The impression is that in Greek tradition, opium seed pods are called golden apples. A grandson of Guy, Ladon, a many-headed serpent, protected the golden apples in the garden of the Hesperides. Serpents with human attributes appear in many mythologies. For example, in Chinese tradition, a dragon with a human face replaced the unusual bird that lived in the sun. And it was a dragon that gave a Chinese emperor the rudiments of writing. Hindu myth talks of Nagas, creatures that are part human and part serpent. Iranian tradition says that for a time, the serpent Azidahaka ruled their world, and from Mesopotamia comes the story of the dragon Kerr, the abductor of Eriskigal, a myth echoed in the Greek story of Persephone. These serpents, or dragons, were human beings politically active in the developing civilizations around four great rivers. Nile, Euphrates, Tigris, Indus. It is not my intention to attempt to identify Eden, the garden in Eden, or the four rivers of Eden, for it could be chance that allows the Bible story to reflect the area that saw the rise of several civilizations. The garden in Eden is an invention. It is an imaginary set for an impossible story, so no garden, no man of dust, no talking snake, and no foundation for Paul's teaching. Identifying the fruit of the tree is no great task. The ancient world was awash with opium, and there is evidence of Neanderthal use. Archaeology says the earliest evidence for modern human use comes from the Mediterranean area. Poppy seed capsules dated to 4200 BC were discovered in Spain. The origin of the opium poppy is unknown, yet various locations have been put forward for consideration. Asia Minor, Northwestern Africa, Southern France and Spain. However, the first reference to poppy cultivation comes from Lower Mesopotamia. Sumerians named it the joy plant, Hul Gil. Accepted theory says Assyria received it from Sumer and passed it to Egypt, where it was cultivated on a grand scale around Thebes. Opium medical uses are recorded in a papyrus dated to about 1550 BC. During part of the 18th dynasty, Egypt's opium trade flourished, and its opium went in Minoan and Phoenician ships to Carthage, Greece, and Europe. The opium came neatly packaged in imitation opium capsules. On Crete, Rhea, the second great matriarch and mother of Zeus, 
is represented with opium poppies on her head. So concluding opium is the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not a giant step. However, identifying the serpentine creature that furnished the Jewish model of the serpent in the garden in Eden is not so straightforward. For a start, serpentine creatures feature in Sumerian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Greek, Hindu, Chinese, Norse, and other mythologies. The great serpents of antiquity are known by name. The serpent in the Jewish Garden of Eden story is unnamed. Eden is a Sumerian term. It means something like flat land. Sumerian myth places Eden between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia. According to Sumerian myth, gods created the first man in Eden. He was a mixture of clay and blood. It is sometimes said that the blood was Kingu's. He was the unsuccessful leader of Tiamat's forces in the war between the old gods and the new gods. Ashur, or Marduk, represents the new gods. The great she-dragon, Tiamat, represents the old gods. The Jewish creation story was written in the 10th century BC. It was intended to show that the Hebrew people were the oldest of all people, and this was accomplished by claiming the Hebrew people descended from the man created in the garden. Ker, a Sumerian dragon, can be understood as a serpent and as an equivalent of Hades, from Greek myth. And it could be that stories about goddesses being taken to Ker or Hades and having to spend time there after eating a single seed of the sacred pomegranate contain information relevant to opium addiction, as serpent and opium are linked. The Yahwist creation of man story is based on the Sumerian creation of man story, but neither story is plausible. There never was a garden in which a man was created out of dust or out of clay and blood. Such things are impossible. Eve's serpent represents an opium-using cult or religion that offered intellectual enhancement through the use of that substance. It does not represent a particular serpentine entity or a supernatural entity. Egyptian myth features the most influential serpents of antiquity. They play important roles in Egyptian tradition. One serpent, Atom, is credited with creating everything. Heliopolitan tradition says that this serpent will assume his original serpent form after destroying his creation, so it seems serpent religion could compete with other religions. Something of this competition, or conflict, is recognizable in the story of the invisible serpent made by Isis to facilitate her subjugation of the sun god, Ra. The impression gained is of an opium-using religion threatening the established religion, and much the same can be said of the unnamed serpent's religion offered to the impossible woman in the Jewish creation story. As there is no real garden of Eden, and no man made of dust, or woman made from his rib, and no talking serpent, where did the opium-promoting religion originate? A clue might be available via the war between the new gods and the great she-dragon Tiamat. The new gods represent the emerging powers of Assyria and Babylon. Now, before the rise of these political powers, the important actors on the world stage were Akkad and Egypt. Their dominance ended around 2134 BC with the collapse of the Akkadian Empire and the Old Kingdom in Egypt. In terms of political power, Egypt was the big serpent in the area before the collapse of the Old Kingdom and by the time Israel supposedly departed Egypt. Egyptian opium had been exported to many different countries, so it seems likely Israel's prohibition of its use is a reaction to its use in Egypt.
One thing is certain. No man of dust or woman made of rib encountered an opium-dealing serpent in a non-existent garden on smooth ground between the Tigris and Euthrates. Three. Three Trees, Part Two. Eden, as it is imagined in the Bible, is an immense area of land. It contains four great rivers. Three of them have been named Nile, Euphrates and Tigris. Many countries existed and still exist in this very large area. Long ago, the Indus was proposed as the fourth great river of the biblical Eden. If that proposal is correct, Eden, as imagined by the Jewish writers of the 10th century BC, extended from Egypt to the Indus Valley. The idea of Eden expressed in Genesis is of a land devoid of humans. Archaeology tells a different story. It is a story of large civilizations around the Nile, Euphrates, Tigris, and the Indus rivers. The entire area, including the Iranian plateau, was subject to early settlement. There were small villages, large towns and big cities, all full of people. It was a busy place, and there were lots of humans living there. Paleoanthropologists say, Humans were not made in that area and did not originate between the four rivers that saw the rise of civilization, but evolved in Africa a long time before they arrived in Eden. At either end of this landmass, serpents play a part in myth. Egyptian myth tells of a world-creating serpent, and Hindu myth talks of serpents prepared to kidnap and blackmail to achieve their ends. One Hindu myth concerns the imprisonment of the sun bird's mother by naggers that demand the drink of the gods as ransom. This myth suggests serpents, naggers, had acquired opium before their acquisition of the drink of the Hindu gods, probably Shiva's cannabis drink. The biblical Eden is a large landmass, and the garden in Eden is that area of smooth terrain between the Euphrates and Tigris, that Sumerian myth refers to as Eden. According to the Jewish story, not only did the tree of knowledge of good and evil grow in the garden, but so too did the tree of life. Adam was denied access to the tree of life, so he could not live. Forever. John takes the tree of life from the garden in Eden's story and grows it into something astonishing. John's tree of life does not work as a tree. No tree is subject to perpetual fruition and no tree can deliver 12 different types of fruit. Revelation says the leaves of John's tree are for the healing of the nations. Healing the nations was a future event. The nations would become sick, but cured by the leaves of John's impossible tree. Another puzzle. A conditioned reflex can be a physical reaction. The reward of a million repetitions, so to speak. The human mind is susceptible to conditioning, Brainwashing is a colloquial term applied to the construction of conditioned mentation. John says the nations will be deceived, brainwashed, by the dragon, beast, and false prophet. The deception began in the time of David and Solomon, with Yahwist claims of descent from a man made of dust. The basic deception was recycled by Paul, and Roman dissemination of Paul's false teaching saw the initial deception and the new model deception invented by Paul begin to dominate the religious landscape within the Roman Empire. Paul's deception of the nations includes his mendacious assertion of a familiar link between Jesus and a man of dust. 
this deception migrated to various countries during the expansion of Western civilization. Its ubiquity was facilitated by Paul's assertion of a special mission to the nations and his self-proclaimed role of apostle to the nations. John foretells the building of the image to the beast through his vision of the conqueror on the white horse. While the image to the beast was being manufactured, the true church was in the wilderness, and it stays there for a time, and times, and half a time. The two wings of a great eagle, another way of describing the spirit like a dove, were given to the real church to help it fly to its hideout in the wilderness. The nations have been deceived, brainwashed. This is the malady the nations must confront. It is a psychological condition, but it can be cured using leaves from John's impossible tree. John situates his tree of life in eschatological imagery, so it is related to his vision of the future. John's tree of life is not a tree. It is a conflation with several features. It represents eternal life. Its leaves act as medicine. It produces 12 different varieties of fruit, and it is a vision of the future. John would have been exposed to three systems used to divide the year into 12 periods. Those systems are the Jewish calendar, the Julian calendar, and Hellenistic astrology, but only the astrological system would allow talk of fruit produced on a monthly basis. Today, most people know which of the 12 signs they were born under, and our birth sign has become part of our identity. So John foresaw a time when astrology would be popular. Since John's time, only two plants with leaves of significance have made a global impact and those plants are tobacco and cannabis. Smoking tobacco is known to be harmful, and tobacco does not affect psychology. Cannabis, on the other hand, has long been cultivated for its medicinal properties, some of which are psychoactive. They affect the mind. That cannabis was used in the Jewish cultus is demonstrated by evidence from the temple to Yahweh, which was found at Tel Arab, in the Negev Desert. The cannabis was employed to produce a psychoactive effect on worshippers. Moses used cannabis to facilitate communication with Yahweh. God communicated with Moses through the smoke that accumulated above the mercy seat, so although cannabis cannot bestow eternal life upon its users, it can be understood as an activity that points the way to God. John's tree of life is a conflation. It is part of his vision of the future, a future in which people identify themselves by zodiac signs and use cannabis for its psychoactive properties and as an indicator of an approach to God, the source of everlasting life. 4. Three Trees, Part 3 The religion Jesus bequeathed humanity is founded upon two paranormal events. The first event involved the spirit like a dove, and the second event involved the morning star, cloven tongues of fire. These two events were separated by several years. One took place while Jesus was alive, and one took place after Jesus had died. Tree number three has the same nature as these two paranormal events. It is a paranormal event. Neither the spirit like a dove nor the morning star event appear in the religion of Israel, but both events are alluded to in Egyptian religious tradition. And the phenomenon that gave rise to the world tree concept is also depicted in Egyptian religious tradition. Presently, a well tree symbol stands unrecognized amongst a number of graphic signs that were used across Europe between 40,000 BC 
and 10,000 BC. A similar symbol was used in a physical sense by Neanderthals living in southwestern France about 176,000 years ago. There, in a cave, Neanderthals constructed a circle out of 4,000 pounds of deliberately broken stalagmite tips and then set fire to it. Ritual activity is suspected. Archaeology at Kostenki, south of Moscow, uncovered a massive circle made of mammoth bones. The circle, which is about 22,500 years old, may have served as a structure for ritual performance. Fire was used inside the ring. Venus figurines found at Kostenki link to similar figurines found in Willendorf near Krem in Lower Austria, which date to about 30,000 years ago. The feature under consideration is a circle. It is a feature which was of interest to modern humans and Neanderthals, and is a feature that has been linked with fire for more than 176,000 years. The Venus of Willendorf is younger than the circle constructed by French Neanderthals, but older than the circle uncovered in Russia. The Venus is also connected to circles. She has concentric circles on her head. They have the appearance of flames. So it could represent a conflation of circle and flame. Circles of fire on the head of the Venus identify her as the sun goddess, perhaps Saul the sun. A similar arrangement is seen in Egyptian tradition where the sun god Ra is protected by nine concentric rings of fire, but through conflation the concentric circles are depicted as a serpent and given the name Mihen. Concentric circle structures are found in Britain, Ireland and elsewhere in Europe. Their connection to solar religion is recognized by archaeology but the meaning of the concentric circle structures is still a mystery to that discipline. A more informative variation of the circle theme is seen in Hindu myth. In that system, the circle of interest is made from the sun, its energy or its rays, and it is essential for the maintenance of order in the universe. It is Sudarshana Chakra, auspicious vision the spiritual weapon of Vishnu. A paranormal event is indicated, a vision of a circle associated with the sun. It is a vision which may have been known to Neanderthals, it was known to modern humans in Ice Age Europe, and it is alluded to in ancient Egyptian religious tradition. It seems to be the oldest religious vision known to humanity. The European sun goddess and the Egyptian sun god were a byproduct of the circle vision. The paranormal event that engendered these solar deity concepts drew attention to the sun and generated a pathway to truth about it. Mythology records a circle made from the sun. This circle is extraordinarily important, for without it the world would descend into chaos. It exists to protect humanity. Jesus saw the heavens open and a spirit like a dove descend upon him. Non-Christian sightings of this spirit report a bird in constant flight, so there may be particular significance to its descent upon Jesus. This event announced the unification of Father and Son. No gospel is completely trustworthy. John's gospel is the most informative about the paranormal role played by Jesus, but it contains erroneous information. It has more than one ending, and its report of the spirit like a dove event is misleading, for only Jesus would have seen that spirit. It is like the morning star event, private. The appearance of the spirit like a dove is best understood 
via non-Christian sources. It is a circle with one pair of wings. In Egyptian tradition, the sun has been introduced into the circle, and in Mesopotamian tradition, the winged circle sometimes contains a god, but no sun. A conflation of winged circle and sun has occurred where the winged circle is shown as a winged sun. Religion features three paranormal circle events, but only one event features the sun. The sun does not feature in the bird of heaven vision, and it does not feature in the morning star event. The morning star is a five-pointed star with a circle at its center. Paranormal events associated with Jesus and his apostles are reflected in Egyptian tradition. In that tradition, Pharaoh was the living Horus, bird of heaven, spirit like a dove. And he expected to join or become the morning star when he died, just as Christians expect to join Jesus when they die. Christian tradition speaks of two nature-changing events, a spirit like a dove event and a morning star event. These events involve sight, but not ordinary sight. It is paranormal sight. Jesus can be understood as a recipient of the supernatural weapon or disc, which exists to protect humanity from chaos. From beyond the grave, Jesus gave his apostles the morning star, and in Revelation, John has Jesus identify himself as the morning star. The morning star has five tongues arranged around a circle. The world tree deserves its name, even though it is not a tree. Latvian tradition says Sal hangs her cloak on the world tree every evening at sunset. Siberian tradition says the world tree is composed of several worlds on top of each other and that shamans travel between the worlds by climbing the tree. Magyar tribes call it the sky high tree or tree without a top and their shamans climbed it to explore the seven supernatural layers of the sky. Hindu tradition says the world tree is a vision, the highest vision of absolute reality. Paranormal activity produced the world tree. Evidence of the phenomena is captured in Egyptian tradition and in European tradition. In Egypt, the vision is depicted as mehen, and in Europe, it is depicted on the head of the Willendorf Venus. So what does it look like? Picture a tube of concentric circles. Now place the sun in the highest circle and place yourself in the lowest circle. Then look up at the sun through the tube of tree rings. That is the vision of the world tree and it points to the existence of that intelligence humanity has called God. Circles have been part of our religion for a very long time. And seen from this perspective, the religion Jesus has bequeathed humanity was a long time in the making. Five, the road to Armageddon. The road to Armageddon begins in the Hebrew Bible and ends in Revelation. Isaiah sets the general direction with his assertion that God will use fire and sword to kill many people when he comes in anger and fury to rebuke those that have transgressed against him. Ezekiel predicts Gog will come to fight against Israel. When that happens, God will get angry and sacrifice on the mountains of Israel Gog and the armies with him. Joel adds that Judgment Day will be terrible, with nations gathered into the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
but that Judah and Jerusalem would be safe because God lives in Zion. Zephaniah says God has decided to gather the nations in order to pour out his anger upon them. He maintains the earth will be devoured by the fire of God's jealousy and he claims God will, at that time, defeat Israel's enemies. Zechariah has it that anyone bothering Jerusalem will be cut into pieces and this would be the case even if the antagonist was all the earth. He has God declare that all nations will be gathered to fight against Jerusalem and that God will seek to destroy all nations that attack Jerusalem. These prophets created the image of Jerusalem surrounded by armies wanting to destroy it and they created the belief that God would destroy those armies and any army that went to war with Jerusalem even if that army was composed of all the armies in the world. Gog makes the leap from Hebrew prophecy to Christian prophecy, where he takes part in the last battle. The number of combatants taking part in that battle are beyond counting. It is a world war. John was one of the first human beings to become a son of God. His transformation took place with the morning star event, so it would be an error to see him as just another human being. John enclosed his message to humanity in bizarre imagery, conundrums and puzzles, and he has made the final battle part of that puzzle. The final battle appears twice in Revelation. The battle is encountered as Armageddon and it is encountered as Gog and Magog. John employs imagery from Ezekiel's Gog and Magog prophecy to announce the battle of Armageddon. So he intended his readers to understand the battle of Armageddon and the battle of Gog and Magog as the same event. It is possible to understand the relationship between Armageddon and Gog and Magog by those defeated. At Armageddon the beast and false prophet are defeated and the battle of Gog and Magog puts an end to that old serpent called the devil and Satan. However, as the beast with the head wound, Israel is head number one and head number eight on the dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, the destruction of one is the destruction of both. During the dragon's incarceration, the beheaded followers of Jesus live and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. This thousand year reign is over the place where Jesus lives. It is not over the earth or material world, the souls involved are dead. John says the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand year reign ends. John means the dead souls under the altar, those seen when the fifth seal is opened, Revelation 6, 9. These dead souls are instructed to rest until their number is complete, killed as they were. Gog and Magog and Armageddon are synonymous terms. They refer to the same battle. It is the battle which destroys the beast, false prophet and dragon. John uses war imagery taken from Ezekiel's Gog and Magog prophecy but indicates his final battle would be, in part, a war of words. Revelation says the kings of the earth and of the whole world will be gathered to the battle by the dragon, beast and false prophet. In other words, the final battle will be caused by a Jewish elite, Israel and Paul. Words feature in the battle. There are three religious messages emanating from Jewish sources. The message of Judaism, 
the message of Paul and the message of Peter and John. The message of Peter and John is the message of the two witnesses. They witness to the paranormal phenomenon at the heart of Christianity, the morning star. The message Peter and John have for the world wins the day. That this event is linked to the final battle can be understood from what happens next. The dead are judged and those who have been destroying the world are them themselves destroyed. John mentions an earthquake. He says it will be the biggest earthquake that has ever been. The sun and moon will be obscured as a result of it. The earthquake has an impact on Jerusalem, the city where Jesus was crucified. It would be as well to keep in mind that John could be using the term earthquake to describe phenomena he could describe in no other way. But, in any case, the event described is truly catastrophic. Six, the message. It is impossible to misunderstand the clues to the identity of the dragon, beast, and false prophet. Anyone interested in these matters should embrace that fact, and they will not go wrong. There is no wriggle room. The head wound identifies Israel as the beast and eighth head on the dragon. So it follows that Jerusalem is the harlot that sits on the beast. Paul's claim that light from heaven shone round about him and the people with him on the road to Damascus identifies him as the false prophet. The Bible message to Israel is do right and be rewarded or do wrong and be punished. Most of the prophets chastise Israel and Judah for their behavior and they accuse kings, priests, prophets, and merchants of dishonesty. The prophets declared the Assyrian conquest of Israel and the Babylonian conquest of Judah, punishment for the dishonest behavior of both kingdoms. With the conquest of Israel and Judah came the prophecy of their return and reunification. The scenario was that after being punished, the children of Israel would return to the land and would never again be removed from it. John's prophecy of the beast that was, was not, but would be again, is based on the prophecy of the return and the most telling clue to the identity of the beast is found in Amos chapter 9. In Revelation, John identifies the Jewish elite by using the color red. This color is based on Lamentations 4-5. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. The Jewish elite is indicated through the red dragon and red horse of Revelation. Conflict between two Christian groups is reflected in the Gospels and letters of those involved. One group consisted of the original Jerusalem church and the Gentile church engendered by Peter, and the other group was founded by Paul. The Gospels and letters are weapons in a war between these two groups. One group had the religion of Jesus, and the other group had Paul's construct. The difference between these groups can be seen in the way the leaders speak about each other. In Galatians, Paul claims his gospel is for the uncircumcision and that the gospel of the Jerusalem church is for the circumcision. In other words, his gospel is for the wider world, while the gospel of Peter is only for the Jews. 
Paul boasts about his aggressive behavior towards Peter at Antioch. However, the language attributed to Peter in 2 Peter when he warns Christians against private interpretations of Scripture is polite. Even though his warning highlights the Gospel of Paul negatively. Peter says the Gospel of Paul is difficult to understand. Paul says only the lost will not understand his gospel. However, the truth is, Paul's gospel is impossible. It begins with a man of dust. Science has established there never was a man of dust, so either the world is lost or Paul's gospel is wrong. Christians cannot have it both ways. John and Peter talk about a paranormal star event. Peter talks of the day star. John talks of the morning star. John says more than the other apostles do about the paranormal content of their religion. And what is important about it is contained in his message to the seven churches in Asia. Towards the end of each section, John alludes to a paranormal experience known to those churches. He describes it as food from the tree of life, a crown of life, hidden manna, white clothing, a white stone bearing a new name, known only to the individual that receives it. The name of New Jerusalem the city that comes down from heaven, the name of God, the new name of Jesus, and the morning star. Most of John's description concerns white light. It is a white light that resembles a crown or line drawing of a star with several points. It would appear in the forehead. Only the individual involved would experience the phenomenon. The phenomenon could not be mistaken for anything natural. John alludes to the experience in his first epistle. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye not that any man teach you. 2.27 New Jerusalem is the camp of the saints. It is the city that comes down from heaven. It is the beloved city. This Jerusalem, not the physical one, is the city threatened in the battle of Gog and Magog. Citizens of this city experience a lack of forehead. It is as though the forehead has been replaced with clear glass, crystal or water. This is an earthly experience not available to murderers, whoremongers, liars, etc. The morning star is Jesus. It is different to the white crown or white star phenomenon. It has color. Paul's false, impossible and evil gospel Turn the paranormal stars of Christianity into icons of evil. John says the morning star will be given to one that overcomes and remains faithful to the end. But this does not mean the one with the morning star will smite the nations after he dies. It is the wicked one that has to be overcome and that must be done on earth. Israel is head one and head eight on the seven-headed dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So Israel is the wicked one. Someone will be given power over the nations. He will smash them to pieces and rule them with a rod of iron. This does not mean someone will be using an iron rod to keep order or to physically destroy countries. It means no one will be able to evade the truth of the relationship between humanity and the intelligence it calls 
God. In chapter 12 of Revelation, John introduces a child born to rule with the rod of iron. It is obvious that the child is Jesus. In chapter 14, the winepress of God's anger is mentioned. Two characters are associated with the winepress. One is an angel with a sickle, and the other is one like unto the Son of Man. John borrows the term Son of Man from Daniel 7, 13, 14, and uses it to indicate Jesus. In chapter 19, one character treads the winepress of God's anger, smites the nations with a sharp sword from his mouth, and rules them with a rod of iron. Once again, it is Jesus, this time as the Word of God. Christianity teaches that Jesus can function in the material world. From beyond the grave, he communicated with his apostles. So it would be an error to imagine Jesus as just another man. According to Revelation, Jesus can send his angel to anyone. He sent it to John 22:16. In John's work, the terms angel and star have the same meaning more often than not. John calls Jesus the morning star. So it is legitimate to understand that star as the angel of Jesus. The ambition of that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, Israel, will be frustrated by the morning star, and humanity will receive the gift of everlasting life from the morning star. This is the message in the Bible. Seven, the final battle. From a certain perspective, the battle of Gog and Magog can be understood as already underway. Jewish immigrants from Russia can be seen as the aggressor from the north. This force is to be destroyed upon the mountains of Israel. Christian prophecy says the seven-headed dragon will perish in this battle. The seven-headed dragon is a word puzzle. The solution is Israel, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, kingdom of the false prophet, and finally Israel again. The kingdom of the false prophet can be easily identified. It is identifiable through its religion. Its religion is an image to the beast. The beast is Israel, and Paul's Israel of God is its image. Israel is the beast with the head wound, a clue that leads to the book of Amos, chapter 9. The beast with the head wound is the last head, head eight, on the seven-headed dragon. The heads on the dragon are empires that rule Israel for a time. Head number seven follows the Roman Empire. The western element of the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire and lasted until 1806. It is therefore legitimate to identify the British Empire as Head 7, the head that would rule over Israel for a short time before it reverted to Israel, Head 8. John's seven-headed dragon is made up of Israel and the foreign powers that would have power over Israel. Each foreign power represents a seven-fold punishment. Now, when the two heads that represent Israel are deducted, six heads are left. When these six heads are counted as sevenfold punishments, they add up to 42, 
and it is this calculation which gives John his motif of 42 months, or 1,260 days. John based this puzzle on Leviticus chapters 25 and 26. Forty-two months is the time the Gentiles tread the holy city underfoot. It is a time in which the two witnesses prophesy. One thousand two hundred and sixty days equals forty-two lunar months. It is the time the woman spends in the wilderness. It coincides with the time, times and a half a time that the woman is nourished and kept safe from the face of the serpent. It is the time in which the beast speaks great things and blasphemies. That 42 months ended when Israel, head eight, was reconstituted and when the British Empire, head seven, withdrew from Israel. This 42 months is not an ordinary time measurement. Israel is to be punished seven times and each punishment is a sevenfold punishment. So the equation is seven times seven. Seven times seven equals 49. The last segment of this 49-month period began with the reconstitution of Israel. It is the time of the last punishment, the last seven plagues. In this period, the cities of the nations fall. The harlot, Jerusalem, is punished. The beast Israel enters everlasting destruction and the battle of Gog and Magog is fought. New Jerusalem is the city under threat during the battle of Gog and Magog. It is not a material object. It is a construct in which the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations and in which the water of life is freely available. The fountain of the water of life, the street of pure gold, transparent glass and clear crystal refer to the same phenomenon. This phenomenon is the city, Revelation 21, 18. The twelve gates leading into the city are named after the tribes of Israel. Each gate is a pearl. The pearl stands for white light. The foundations of the wall of the city contain the names of the twelve apostles, and twelve kinds of precious stones feature in the foundations of the wall. The precious stones signify colored light. John's city has the appearance of transparent glass, and it contains a display of white and colored light. Another reference to this phenomenon is the sea of glass mingled with fire. John has those who have gotten victory over the beast stand upon this. Revelation 15, 2. This phenomenon is the holy city that is trodden underfoot for 42 months. It is the woman that fled into the wilderness for 1,260 days. It is the woman that spends a time, and times, and half a time in the wilderness, Revelation chapter 12. It is the religion of the twelve apostles. It is not the false religion of Paul. His religion, followers, and churches are the Gentiles that tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. John introduces the number 12 into his description of the holy city. 12,000 furlongs, 12 gates, 12 foundations, and 144 cubits. The 144 cubits link with the number of sealed individuals from the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Revelation 7, 4. When the facade is discounted, John's city is recognizable as a paranormal phenomenon. The teaching of Jesus is embodied in this phenomenon. It is a phenomenon in which ordinary light plays no part. The light in this phenomenon is provided by 
heaven. It is that light which Jesus names God. It is the light that cannot be understood by those who live in the darkness. It is the light, fire from heaven, and it shines in the forehead. It is this city that is under threat from the dragon and its allies. The world has been deceived. It has been deceived about religion. John maintains Jesus gave his life to correct this situation, and he corrected the situation by being lifted up as the serpent was lifted up by Moses, John 3, 14. Moses lifted up a brass serpent as a cure against a plague of fiery serpents, Numbers 21, 9. So Jesus can be seen as a cure for what is wrong with religion. The assertion that if Jesus is lifted up from the earth, he will attract all people to him is an important element of the crucifixion, John 12, 32. Through this sacrifice, the world is healed. It is reunited with its true religion. Humanity's true religion is older than Israel. No part of this religion is discernible in the traditions of Israel or in the religion of Paul. But the phenomenon described by John does connect with some traditions which are not of Israel, Greek, Norse, Australian. This phenomenon has two prominent features. One feature is the water of life, Revelation 22, 1. The other feature is the sound of many waters, Revelation 14, 2. The sound of many waters can be understood as the sound of a rushing mighty wind from heaven, Acts 2, 2. And it can be understood as the talking trumpet, Revelation 4, 1. This phenomenon will be apparent in the forehead. This is also where the clouds of heaven are encountered. The water of life will be apparent as a missing forehead, and the sound of many waters will be apparent as a high-pitched sound or buzz. Color can be glimpsed in the water. This water is the sea of glass mingled with fire, and it is upon this that those who have gained victory over the beast stand. Revelation 15, 2. This phenomenon links with Greek tradition and Iris, the rainbow messenger to the gods. It also connects with Norse tradition and Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, or fleetingly glimpsed rainbow. Furthermore, it links with the rainbow serpent of Australian tradition. The rainbow serpent of Australian tradition is not the serpent of the Adam and Eve story. Bifrost links to the concentric circles phenomenon. This phenomenon is known as Mihen in Egyptian tradition and as the world tree in European tradition. Evidence of this phenomenon can be retrieved from artifacts manufactured in North Africa more than 90,000 years ago. New Jerusalem is a paranormal phenomenon and it links with ancient traditions that feature real paranormal content. The morning star is the phenomenon that carries the most authority, but that star does not travel alone. It keeps company with the bird of heaven and the world tree. New Jerusalem is derived from these phenomena, and it is this city that is under threat in the battle of Gog and Magog the final battle. Eight, a tale of two Gospels. The Christian religion consists of two Gospels. One Gospel is derived from the church founded by Jesus, and one Gospel is derived from the church founded by Paul. These two Gospels are very different, and they should not be Conflated. The message associated with the original Christian group contains information about genuine paranormal phenomena. 
but the message associated with Paul contains evidence of fabricated phenomena. Paul, whose influence dominates the so-called New Testament, named his church the uncircumcision, and he named the original church the circumcision. Paul says, Romans 15, 8, Jesus came to confirm promises made to the Jewish people. In Galatians, he claims the gospel of Peter was for the circumcision and that his gospel was for the uncircumcision. He asserts his gospel is for the Gentiles. He means it is for every person that is not Jewish. Paul claims Jesus chose him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and he claims Jesus gave him a gospel for them. But in Acts 15, 7, Peter says he was chosen to teach the Gentiles. There is conflict here. The Gospel of Peter is the same for Jew and Gentile, but the Gospel of Paul is intended specifically for the Gentiles. Paul alleged his message for the uncircumcision came directly from Jesus. In his self-proclaimed role as apostles to the nations, he wanted the world to accept Jesus had informed him that the first man was made of dust. Paul's version of the Hebrew creation story gained ground through the spread of Christianity. It became the creation story, and people around the world were educated to accept it as true. Paul's version of the Hebrew creation story held its ground until challenged by Darwin's theory of evolution. Today, most people accept evolution as true, but Paul's impossible creation story is still circulating. Science supports the idea of human evolution. For science, a man made of dust is impossible, but if the science is correct, the gospel of Paul must be incorrect. It must be untrue. Paul's claim of a man made of dust is untrue. So either Jesus lied to him, or he lied about receiving information directly from Jesus. It seems unlikely Jesus wanted the world to believe a lie, yet the world was educated to believe the man of dust lie. This lie is essential to the gospel of Paul. His gospel is built upon this lie. In 1 Corinthians 11.23, Paul claims his information about the Eucharist came directly from Jesus. The Eucharist is the ceremony in which bread and wine supposedly become the body and blood of Jesus. Paul established the ceremony. So those Gospels that feature a last bread and wine event could only have been written after Paul introduced the practice. Three Gospels feature a last supper bread and wine event. These Gospels were influenced by Paul and they were written to support his narrative. Three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, flow from Paul's Gospel for the Gentiles the uncircumcision. Matthew and Mark speak of the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is a feature in a prophecy from the book of Daniel. This prophecy forms an important part of Paul's gospel, and he refers to it in his second epistle to the Thessalonians 2.3. Paul's son of perdition is the vile person of Daniel 11. 21. This individual is responsible for placing the abomination of desolation. He is the wicked character in Paul's gospel. Paul says the wicked character will be destroyed by Christ before Christians are taken up to meet Christ in the air.
In Paul's Gospel, the abomination of desolation is set up shortly before the second coming, and the wicked individual responsible for setting up the abomination of desolation is destroyed by Christ at the second coming. There are two obvious problems with this part of Paul's Gospel. The first problem is that the abomination of desolation event spoken of by Daniel transpired under Antiochus IV. He died in 163 BC. And the second problem is that there is no longer a temple in which to place the abomination of desolation, a statue of Zeus. Luke does not mention the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel 12:11. For Luke, the time to escape the area is not when the abomination of desolation is set up. The time to escape the area is when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. He sees this moment as the beginning of a time of desolation for that city. Luke's assertion 21:24 that Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, links to Paul's assertion in Romans 11, 25, 26. Paul says that when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, all Israel will be saved. The Gospel of Paul, which is supported by three Gospels, begins with a man made of dust and ends with Israel being saved. Paul wanted his Gentiles, the uncircumcision, the Israel of God, to believe Jesus had given him a message especially for them. Paul's message for the Gentiles says, God made a man out of dust. But that man committed a sin and that sin caused death to reign over all human beings until Moses brought the law, and that the law freed humanity from death, and that Jesus came to redeem humanity from the law of Moses. A man of dust is essential to Paul's gospel for the Gentiles, but science says no such man ever existed. So it is reasonable to conclude that Paul's gospel for the Gentiles is impossible. Peter and John enjoy the same gospel. Paul says their gospel was meant only for Jewish people, the circumcision. Peter took this gospel to Cornelius, so it was the first gospel given to the Gentiles and the first Gentile followers of Jesus received the Holy Spirit during Peter's visit. The Holy Spirit is a benefaction in the Gospel of Peter and John. It is the experience mentioned in John's first letter, 1 John 2.27. This experience is a marvelous lesson, and it makes human teachers of religion redundant for it initiates teaching by the Holy Spirit. Paul wanted to deny the Gentiles Peter's gospel, but the engendering of the first Gentile children of the light is linked to Peter's gospel. The Holy Spirit appears as light, fire, and this light can be described as cloven tongues of fire or it can be described as the day star. Some stars are significant in the Gospel of Peter and John, and in their Gospel, Jesus is the morning star. There is no abomination of desolation event in the Gospel of Peter and John. The character responsible for placing that image in the Jerusalem temple does not feature in their Gospel. The antagonist of their gospel is a seven-headed dragon. John identifies three enemies, dragon, beast, and false prophet. The false prophet is the second beast encountered in Revelation 13:11. He pretends to be for Jesus, 
but he is an agent of the dragon. And that is why he is said to resemble a lamb, but speak like a serpent. This man deceives the world. He does this with a Christian gospel. This gospel is so similar to the original Christian gospel that only certain individuals can tell the difference. Freedom is the fruit of the true Christian gospel, and subjection is the fruit of the false Christian gospel. The false Christian gospel has the beast with the head wound as its object of worship, and most of the world's population will worship this beast, so knowing its identity is a matter of interest. John gives two clues to the identity of the beast with the head wound. Those clues are the head wound and the number 666. Both clues deliver the name Israel. The head wound clue is derived from the book of Amos chapter 9. And it refers to the ten tribes of Israel. John makes this beast the first beast encountered in Revelation, rise up out of the sea, and he does this to indicate the return of the ten tribes, or northern kingdoms scattered by Assyria. Israel is the beast with the head wound. It is the beast that was, then was not, but which would be again. Two clues are given to the name of the man with the false gospel. He wants the world to build an image to the beast with the head wound, and he makes fire from heaven visible to the naked eye. Israel is the beast with the head wound, so the man with the false gospel wants the world to build an image to Israel. The paranormal light, fire from heaven, does not shine on anything. So anyone who claims the light from heaven shone on him, or that it shone on people around him, is being dishonest. The man with the false gospel, a gospel that is so like the true gospel, that only the elect can tell the difference, is Paul. His Israel of God, Galatians 6.16, is the image to the beast, and his claim that light from heaven shone round about him and those with him is a lie. Acts 26, 13. The elect, those who cannot be deceived by the false prophet's miracles, know the light from heaven, cloven tongues of fire or day star, shines only in the forehead. In the gospel that Paul says was meant only for Jewish people, Jesus is the morning star, and the children of light enter into a union with him. A man of dust does not appear in the gospel of Peter and John. Their gospel features a man chosen by the intelligence Christians call God the Father, this intelligence is able to deploy the spirit like a dove, bird of heaven. And in their gospel, Jerusalem, the harlot, burns, and Israel suffers everlasting destruction. Paul claims there are two gospels. He says one was meant only for Jewish people, the circumcision, and the other, his gospel, was meant for everyone else, the uncircumcision. The so-called gospel of the circumcision contains information of real significance. The important information in this gospel has a paranormal source, and it links with ancient traditions that feature a morning star and bird of heaven. Paul's gospel for the uncircumcision has been used to deceive the nations. This gospel generated the false miracles necessary to the deception 
and those false miracles include the turning of bread and wine into flesh and blood, the Eucharist. The star experience described as cloven tongues of fire in Acts is a real experience. And in the experience, a five-pointed star constructed of paranormal light shines in the forehead. This phenomenon is the strongest recorded evidence available to support life after death theories. It is light fire from a paranormal location. Paul has nothing to do with this light. It did not shine in his forehead, and it is not an experience recorded amongst those that accepted his gospel for the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. Clearly, there are two gospels, but only one contains the truth, and that one is the gospel associated with Peter and John, the circumcision. That gospel is opposed to the Jewish narrative. The other gospel is a false gospel used to deceive the world and to render it compliant to the Jewish narrative. 9. Things to Come Revelation is a book concerning things to come. It was written about 2,000 years ago, so by now, some of the prophecies contained in the book should have been fulfilled. One important prophecy concerns the return of the beast with the head wound. This beast returns from the bottomless pit. Israel is the beast with the head wound. John took material from the book of Amos, chapter 9, to construct his head wound clue to the identity of the beast. The return of the beast prophecy is important as a time indicator, for some of the prophesied events take place only after the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, whether by design or by accident, this watershed prophecy came to fruition when Israel was re-established, 19 48. When the beast comes up from the pit, it makes war against John's two witnesses. These witnesses link to the book of Zechariah 4.14. John takes the two anointed ones from Zechariah and he turns them into prophets with powers surpassing those attributed to Moses. The two witnesses are powerful individuals. They are not ordinary men. Fire issues from their mouths to kill those who would hurt them. So it is certain they have been anointed with the fire from heaven and that their report, their testimony, cannot be faulted or defeated. John's two witnesses are dressed in sackcloth Sackcloth is a material associated with mourning, so it seems right to conclude the two witnesses are in mourning for Jesus. They prophesy in sadness for 1,260 days. 1,260 days is the time the woman that brought forth the child, who is destined to rule all nations, spends in the wilderness. Jesus is the child destined to rule all nations, and the associated woman is the original Jewish Christian church. The two witnesses, or anointed ones, testify from the earliest Christian period to the return of the beast. Their testimony is not a spoken testimony, it is a written testimony. Their testimony is in the so-called New Testament. Peter and John give the most important testimony, but their testimony has been eclipsed by Paul's false testimony. 
Peter and John testify to the star experience at the heart of Christ's religion. They both received that experience in the cloven tongues of fire event. They are the two witnesses, the two anointed ones. 1,260 days is equivalent to a time and times and half a time. The woman that brought forth the child spends time in the wilderness, and that time can be represented in the two ways presented above. The source of the second description is the book of Daniel 12.7. Daniel and John see the end of this period as pivotal. Daniel says the prophecies in his book conclude at this time. John says it signals the return from the wilderness of the woman who brought forth the child. The triumph of the two witnesses, a great earthquake and the destruction of those who are destroying the earth. Two events must take place before this moment is reached. In Revelation, these events are overseen by angels five and six. Event number one involves people suffering torment. The torment starts after they have been stung by locusts using scorpion-like stings. The clue John gives to the identity of the locusts with the scorpion-like stings leads to the beard and peyote worn by some Jewish men. John's clue is constructed from Leviticus 19.27. He uses the clue to indicate that the stinging which causes the torment will be a Jewish enterprise. The second event is a world-changing war. It takes place on land west of the Euphrates. It is Armageddon and Gog and Magog. It is a war in which the beast, false prophet and dragon are defeated. The beast is head one and head eight on the seven-headed dragon. So to destroy the beast is to destroy the dragon. Event number two lasts until the time of Angel 7 and the Great Earthquake. The triumph of the two witnesses, the woman's return from the wilderness and the destruction of those destroying the earth take place during the time of the sixth angel. Angel 6, the penultimate actor in this drama, ushers in a world-changing war. John describes two of the weapons used in this war. The weapons he described were to be deployed in a future war. So they were not weapons available to the armies of 2,000 years ago. One weapon is a tail with a serpent's head, and that tail belongs to the second weapon, a horse with a lion's mouth. Both weapons produce fire, smoke, and brimstone sulfur. The phenomena described by John, fire, smoke, and brimstone, could link with a war involving guns and tanks, but they would not link with a war involving sword and spear. In the war, those who are destroying the earth are destroyed. The beast false prophet and dragon are defeated in the war and all three end up in a lake of fire burning with brimstone. The beast is head eight, the last head on the dragon. So the end of the beast is also the end of the dragon. Hell and death also end up in the lake of fire for they will be seen to have no actual existence. In fact, Every impediment to the true Christian religion, the religion of the two witnesses, will end up in the lake of fire. The lake of fire will impact human psychology and belief systems. It will also impact an area of land surrounded by land, turning it into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. 
so most of the earth will not be consumed and there will be survivors. Revelation 21, 24. The physical location of the lake of fire is limited to the physical location of the defeated enemies. Israel is the beast and it is head eight on the dragon, so the lake of fire must appear where Israel is, for Israel cannot be taken to another location. Angel 7, the last actor in the drama, ushers in the greatest ever earthquake. The earthquake is linked to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, Revelation 16, 14. John is attempting to describe an unprecedented wartime event, an event for which he had no language. So his description of the event could be a rough description. The earthquake could be a massive explosion. 10. The Morning Star There are many stories about the Morning Star. The planet Venus, under different names, is the morning star in most of these stories. Under the name Lucifer, Lightbringer, it has become the personification of evil. It is the star of Satan. The morning star at the heart of the Christian religion is not the planet Venus. It is not seen in the sky and it does not herald the dawn. The morning star linked to Peter and John is a paranormal light that shines in the forehead. Israel's religion does not feature a paranormal morning star event. Israel's prophets report no morning star experience. The experience was not recorded in Israel before the cloven tongues of fire event. The Christian morning star experience could have been described differently. No heavenly voice announces the experience and there is no label or name tape attached to the phenomenon. John chose to name the phenomenon the morning star, but his naming of the phenomenon was neither arbitrary nor naive. It was deliberate and informed. A reasonable description of the Pentecost event is available through John's writing, for John's morning star is a description of the phenomenon he experienced in his forehead during the Pentecost event. Egypt's morning star links with John's morning star. The Egyptian morning star has five points. There is little evidence to show why ancient Egyptian artists used a five-pointed star design, for none of the thousands of stars visible to the naked eye show a five-pointed twinkle. The five-pointed star hieroglyph is not derived from diffraction spikes. It is derived from a design composed of a circle encompassed by five tongues. This design is apparent in some tombs and on some sarcophagi. John's morning star is the visual phenomenon in the cloven tongues of fire event. John's language suggests he perceived a resemblance between his religion and the religion of ancient Egypt. In Egyptian religious tradition, five pointed stars link with the afterlife and the souls that get there. Ancient Egyptian religion maintained Pharaoh became the morning star in the afterlife. Priest and praise were associated with the five-pointed star, and late in Egyptian history, the five-pointed star was used to write God. So it seems valid to assign a spiritual value to the Egyptian morning star. Second Peter gives the impression of a star arising inside a person. That star also describes the visual phenomenon in the cloven tongues of fire event. P. 
Peter and John testify to a star that can be received internally. Their morning star is comparable with the Egyptian morning star. For both stars link with information connected to paranormal themes, so the link between Christianity and ancient Egyptian religion could be a paranormal star composed of a circle encompassed by five tongues. Jesus became the morning star. He appeared as the morning star. Second Peter says this morning star can arise in the heart. The other morning star, the planet Venus, plays a part in various mythologies. In some mythologies, the planet has female form, but in other mythologies, the planet has male form. Most mythologies have no myth in which a king becomes the morning star. No Greek became Phosphorus, and no Roman became Lucifer. Phosphorus and Lucifer are not shown as a star. Lucifer is a torch-bearing young man in Roman myth. Yet a five-pointed star became his symbol. The Christian morning star does not represent Lucifer or Satan. In Christian prophecy, Satan is a seven-headed dragon. Israel is head one and head eight on that seven-headed dragon. Paul says there are two Gospels. He says there is one Gospel for the circumcision Jewish people and another gospel for the uncircumcision, non-Jewish people. Each gospel has a unique Satan. In the gospel for the circumcision, Satan is a word puzzle. Yet in the gospel for the uncircumcision, Satan is a supernatural being. The supernatural Satan was engendered by Paul. In 2 Corinthians, he says, Jewish Christians opposed to him worked for Satan and that Satan had disguised himself as an angel of light. The Jewish Christians opposed to Paul said he was dishonest. The Jewish Christians experienced Jesus as a paranormal star-shaped light. This is the light that Paul named Satan. Two religions have a man that became the morning star. One morning star is recorded as a paranormal phenomenon in the Christian religion. Luke calls that phenomenon cloven tongues of fire. John calls it the morning star. The Egyptian morning star has stone age origins. It is depicted as a circle encompassed by five tongues. The Christian morning star and the Egyptian morning star appear related. So the Christian morning star could have been known in Stone Age Egypt. In ancient Egyptian religion, Pharaoh becomes the morning star in the afterlife. In the Christian religion, Jesus returns from the afterlife as the morning star and no diffraction spikes can occur with this morning star, for it does not shine in the sky, it shines in the forehead. The Christian morning star is clear proof, proof positive, that God exists. <laughs>